Hello, welcome to Bible study. I hope you're doing well, enjoying a beautiful week before it turns cold. So uh, get outside and, and enjoy a few warm days as much as you can. Uh, the lesson for today uh, comes from Mark chapter 14. For the last several weeks we have been uh, walking with Jesus along the, the path to the cross. And uh, today we are looking at that part of the of the message of the gospel that uh, brings Jesus to Gethsemane. And uh, we're going to see that he is betrayed uh, by Judas and how the disciples uh, respond to all of this. And, uh, and we're going to see Jesus at the first trial, the trial of the Sanhedrin, and uh, how he responds to the questions that are asked of him there. So uh, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 14, and we're going to begin uh, with um, verse 32, where he comes to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, the experience there. So before we walk into this, let's uh, pause it for a word of prayer. God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts and minds today as we uh, have been on this path of Jesus toward the cross now for the last several weeks. Uh, God, um, enlighten our hearts, enlighten our minds, Lord, that we might fully understand the impact of what Jesus is doing for us to pay for our sins and to give us the gift of eternal life. So, Lord, speak to us now in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, we are coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this was a place where Jesus frequently went to spend time with the Father to pray. Uh, do you ever have trouble finding enough time to pray? Well, some people do, uh, but Jesus found time to pray. And when he found those times to pray to his Father, it, it was not just some cursory prayer, just something that... Uh, some routine kind of thing. Uh, it was personal for him. It was powerful because it was always about life and death. And uh, he needed to stay close to the Father to be able to, to go through with what he had committed to do and what the Father had committed to do in and through uh, his life. So uh, let's, uh, let's begin looking at... Uh, uh, Mark chapter 14, <coughs> verse 32, excuse me. <coughs> then they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be deeply distressed. And the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, and horrified, horrified. Now, uh, why would he be so distressed that he is horrified at this point. Uh, simply this, Jesus could see what was coming. He could see what was going to happen. Uh, and, and this was more than just about physical death that he knew was coming. Uh, this was about the weight of all the sins of all mankind upon him and and the, the result that would be... Uh, carried out if he was faithful to do what he had come into this world to do, that is, pay the price uh, for our sins. Excuse me just a minute. I've got a tickle in my throat today. A little cup of coffee will usually help us out. He says to Peter, James, and John, and why Peter, James, and John? Simply this. Uh, they were the ones who had been so close to him. Uh, they were the three disciples that he took with them to the Mount of Transfiguration where they saw Moses and Elijah with Jesus. Jesus knew that these were the men who were going to carry on the work uh, up front. Uh, they were going to have most of the weight of responsibility for, for leading uh, the other disciples and for leading the church that he is establishing uh, by what he is doing here. So it's very, very important that these men uh, be with him. Uh, you ever been through those times when, you know, it, it's just so hard, just so hard. You, you've never been in, through anything as difficult as this before. Uh, maybe a sickness, maybe a, a friend or a parent or a child uh, is, is about to die. 
and and you just you just can't stand it. You've got to have somebody with you uh, that you know that you love dearly. Though, so he took Peter and James and John with him. Well, uh, you could you could read even more about that that relationship. He took Peter and James and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed, horrified. Then he said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. Then he went a little further, fell to the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Not what I will, but what you will. Uh, he says here, uh, Father, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, is, is he talking about the cup of, of sin that he's bearing? Uh, no, he is talking about the cup of wrath of his Father that is going to be coming uh, upon those who are not believers, upon those who... Uh, who will not trust, who will not believe in a God of love and, and a God of salvation. And all of that judgment, all the wrath of God is going to be in that cup that Jesus is going to drink. When you and I sin, it just adds to the cup of wrath. It adds to the cup of wrath. Now, because we've trusted Christ as Savior, uh, then that cup of wrath is taken away from us and is placed upon the Lord Jesus, and this is why he, he could feel all the wrath of God in judgment upon every person who had ever lived, beginning with Adam and Eve, all the way up uh, to that time, and knowing that uh, the world's not about to end at that particular point, evidently, and uh, so for all the sins of all mankind who would ever live upon the face of this earth, uh, it, it's beyond our ability to imagine what all of that weight of sin, uh, producing that kind of judgment on the part of God, what that could do to Jesus, not just physically, not just the death of his physical body that would be raised again in three days, not just that, but the emotional, the spiritual weight that was literally crushing him to the point of death. So he says, not what I will, but... Uh, what you will, Father. Uh, God is unchanging. We, we can be so thankful for the fact that God does not change. We have that confirmation in his word in Malachi uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. He says, I do not change. I do not change. Again, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, he said, I am the same yesterday and today and forever. We can be thankful for that kind of God that when he says something, it's in stone. It's not going away. He is going to carry out exactly what he says he will do. God's being and attributes along with his ethical commitments that he has given to us, those things cannot change. This means that uh, among other things that God is committed to being God and that he is always the same. God's unchanging nature is good news for Christians, for, for it guarantees that God does not change his mind, or he does not go back on it. Did you ever change your mind about something? Did you ever go back on a promise that you had made to somebody else, and then later you grieved over it because you knew that wasn't right? You made a promise, but you, you didn't keep it. Well, we don't have to worry about that with God, because when he makes a promise, he keeps it. As Christians, we can have peace of mind and assurance in knowing that God who brought us out of sin and death and into salvation and eternal life, uh, he's going to carry through on all, A-L-L, -L, big capital letters, all of his promises to us. The second part of this lesson comes from verses 43 through 49. But I want to go ahead and read this part in between these two sections here because it's important. Then he came and found them sleeping. Simon, are you sleeping? He asked Peter. Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, the important thing about this is that uh, right before this happened, uh, uh, Peter had said to Jesus' face, Oh, you don't have to worry about me. I won't ever forsake you. I won't ever, because Jesus has just said, You're all going to forsake me. And Peter said, No, not me. 
And all these other guys may forsake you. They may run away, but not me. Oh, no, no, no. And Jesus said to him right there, he said, Peter, before the cock crows tomorrow, before the sun comes up tomorrow, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter just couldn't believe it. Well, here he is. He's already uh, denying Jesus by his failure to do what Jesus asked. Jesus said, just guys, just stay here and pray. Uh, they were just a, a, a few feet away from him, but they were so tired, they were so sleepy that they just couldn't keep their eyes open. So Jesus comes back and said, Peter, couldn't you just stay awake and pray for just one hour? When's the last time you prayed for one hour? Well, I hope it's on a regular basis because it, it builds up a spirit within us, a relationship with God that, that nothing can take away. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And he came, that is, Jesus was saying the same thing to the Father about if, if it's possible for this cup to pass, the cup of your wrath. If it's possible for me to have to bear that, if it's impossible for me to, to, to bear that, Lord, you know, help me. But take it away if you can. If there's any other way, well, there wasn't any other way. And Jesus knew that. Then they did not know what to say to him. When Jesus is saying, is, is talking to his disciples, they didn't know what to say to him. Then he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, enough. The time has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. He knew that Judas was on his way. He knew that Judas would know where he was. How did Jesus know where he was? Because Jesus went there often when, when he needed to pray, when he wanted to pray. So often he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, so Judas knew exactly where he would be. Verse 43, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. With him was a mob with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had given them a signal. The one I kiss, he's the one, he's the one, arrest him and take him away under guard. So now this is Judas. Judas had been one of the 12 disciples, been with Jesus now for almost three years. Uh, uh, Judas knew, but Judas wanted Jesus to be an earthly savior. He wanted him to be a, 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 a strong Messiah who would come with a sword and, and would beat down all of, of, uh, uh, of the enemies of Israel. And, and Judas wanted to be one of the guys who, who Jesus would put in charge if that happened. And Jesus wasn't about to do that. So Judas is going to try to force Jesus into that kind of role, into being that Davidic Messiah. He's going to try to make him show his hand, make him, make him stand up for himself and be their leader. No, that was not Jesus' plan at all. So uh, uh, Judas leads this, this gang in there with him, the chief priests and uh, a bunch of the elders of, of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and he says, come on. To the, uh, and so they had swords, they had clubs, and it's just unimaginable. The one I kiss, he's the one, arrest him, take him away under, under guard, under guard. Uh, Judas, maybe he thought that the other disciples were going to try to uh, fight against uh, these guys who had come to take Jesus. So when he came, he went right up to him and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, the, this part of it was not so unusual because the holy kiss, which is described, Paul describes this later in his writing, uh, that was not an unusual thing for a man to kiss another man on the cheek, maybe sometimes on on both cheeks. And, and for those uh, who respected the rabbis, the teachers of the law, uh, they, to say rabbi, that was not unusual. And one of those who stood by drew his sword, struck the ear of the high priest slave and cut off his ear. Wow. Amazingly, Jesus is still full of grace uh, to the point that he, even here, even though he knows he's about to be tried as a criminal and sent to the cross, he still has time to pick up that ear and, and, and put it back uh, in its place. Uh, Malchus was the name of the high priest. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 51 tells us about Jesus' action there of, of restoring that ear immediately. So full of grace, full of love, always, even to the very end. And uh, Jesus says, uh, Peter, uh, put your sword away. Uh, it, it's enough. 
You don't need you don't need any more sword. So uh, and and although Jesus protested, uh, although he surrendered to the high priests and the soldiers, he said, yeah, hey "Guys, why are you coming here with swords, and clubs? I, I've been in in the uh, you know in the court of the temple. I've been outside there in the outer court uh, teaching uh, every day. You guys could have arrested me anytime you wanted to. Uh, why now? You saw I wasn't." Uh, I wasn't a, a person who was violent, and yet you come at me like I'm a, a murderer or somebody who's going to overthrow the government. Uh, and uh, he said, why, why are you doing this? But he says that it has to be done this way in order to fulfill the scripture, and that's pointed out here in verse uh, 49. Uh, but that the scriptures must be fulfilled. So that's why all of these things are happening just like they are uh, because the scripture said this is what was going to happen. Even as far back as Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, this was laid out very very clearly that, uh, that this was going to happen. Uh, Isaiah 53, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the one who would not fight back, the, the, the shepherd uh, who would be slain, and so all of these things, all these scriptures, Jesus said, I am now fulfilling these scriptures. Well, uh, the picture here is one of Christ as a sacrifice. There are several signs and symbols and, and pointers in the Old Testament that foreshadowed Christ as being the sacrificial lamb of God who was going to come and take away the sins of the world. Uh, however, unlike the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, uh, whose, those sacrifices were not able to take away sin, uh, according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. But Christ's sacrifice on the cross was able to permanently, permanently, once for all, the scripture says in Hebrews 10, 4, permanently, once for all, to take away the sin of the world. One, one sacrifice was all it would take. And that would be the sacrifice of Jesus. Then the last part of this lesson for today talks about Jesus affirming his identity as the Messiah. We've seen him affirming the will of the Father, uh, affirming the plan that was foretold in Scripture, and then third, Jesus affirming his identity as the Messiah. And uh, we pick up again in Mark chapter 14, verse 53. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes convened. Peter followed him at a distance right into the high courts, the high priest courtyard. He was sitting at the temple police, uh, with the temple police, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could find none. For many were giving false testimony against him, but the testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and were giving false testimony against him, stating, We heard him say, I'll demolish this sanctuary made by human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. Yet their testimony did not agree even on this. Then the high priest stood up before them all and questioned Jesus. Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer anything again, an affirmation of what's in, in Isaiah chapter 53. Again, the high priest questioned him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? In other words, are you the Son of God? That's the question. And Jesus answered forthrightly, directly. It was time. I am said Jesus. Now, Jesus could have just said, yes. He could have just given a simple answer, yes. But he said, I am. Now, what did that remind all of those who were listening? What did that remind? It took them all the way back to Moses all of a sudden. Moses getting ready to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's out in the desert. God appears to him in the burning bush. And God says, who am I going to tell them has sent me? And God says, I tell them I am has sent you. So, wow, these guys knew what all that meant. I am. In other words, not only am I the son of the blessed one, as you say, but I am. In other words, I'm a son of God. I am. God, I am, said Jesus, and all of you will see the Son of Man 
the term that he used for himself so often, seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds. Uh, again, a reference back to Psalm 110 and verse 1. Another reference to uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse uh, 13. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, Why do we need any more witness? We have heard the blasphemy. Blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Oh, what a, what a terrible, terrible moment that was uh, for Jesus. And, uh, but Jesus knew what was coming. This, none of this was a surprise. Uh, this first trial immediately after his arrest was at night, which was a violation of the law right there. They were supposed to, the Sanhedrin trials were supposed to be during uh, the daytime when people could come and hear. They were the ruling body. The Sanhedrin was the ruling body of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Uh, they were looking for testimony against Jesus, but none uh, could be found. And even those who tried were not in agreement with that. They couldn't even agree on what they were going to try to charge him with. So Jesus' silence against all these accusations would later be remembered as predicted in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. Uh, and uh, uh, but but he had charged them to keep that information silent. He had he had talked to his disciples about this earlier, but now Jesus openly admits in answer to the high priest's question that he is the Messiah. To wrap this up, to conclude this lesson for Sunday, the religious leaders put Jesus on trial to judge and condemn him. Uh, many people in the world still do that today, even believers, even those who say, well, I'm a Christian, I've trusted Jesus, but even believers today sometimes still question uh, Jesus and his promises, asking, Jesus, are you really so good, are you really so good that I don't have to look anywhere else for rescue? A lot of people ask that, a lot of Christians still ask that. Are you really so gracious? Are you really so full of grace that I don't have to do anything else to earn my way into heaven? The truth of the gospel is absolutely yes. 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 Jesus has taken care of it all. Jesus really is able to forgive us and to cleanse us from sin so that one day when we stand before God, Jesus will say when Satan tries to point a finger at us and say, this man is a sinner, he's a terrible sinner, Jesus will step forward and say, not guilty. His sins are already forgiven. They were paid for with my blood. Paid for with my blood. Folks, that's powerful. That's powerful to realize and to understand that our sins were forgiven are forgiven, will be forgiven, all because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection and conquering of death when he came out of the grave on the third day. He says, I've already paid for their sin in full. To purchase salvation for sinners, Jesus submitted to betrayal, to chains, to false accusation, and to death so that guilty sinners, you and me, could one day stand before God free. And until that time that we can live in this world forgiven, forgiven, and living with the promise of all that Jesus has already done for us and to be made free from the chains of our own sin and to be made free from the sin and the results of sin, which is death, to be set free from that. Oh my goodness, this is a wonderful, powerful passage that shows us Jesus on his way to the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you again for the great price that was paid, the cup that Jesus drank, which was the cup of wrath uh, that uh, you were preparing for all of those who were sinners, but Jesus said, no, Father, I'm willing to pay the price. I will do what I came to this earth to do. I'm going to pay the price. 
Thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.